Uh, I guess what I would like to offer Diane is just our open hearts to hear what God has to say through you. And uh, I encourage all of you to listen, uh, get in a position and take some notes. There may be some things. Uh, I was reading Diane's book this morning, trying to find a thing that I wanted to kind of share as an introduction. And I just went from one entry to another and finally I had to stop reading because I, <laughs> I was just really overwhelmed by it. Um, I met Diane a few years ago. She was serving a bunch of us uh, as I got to know her church, World Hearts Outreach in Chambersburg, and her pastor, Mark Derniak. And uh, what started from that beginning has just introduced me to one of my favorite people in the world. So here's Diane Hillman. And uh, Diane, here's Joyland. Hi, everybody. Can I talk a little bit? Can't hear. We're good. Okay, we're good. Okay, yay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> okay. So, um, first of all, it was so cool. Like when you guys were doing your worship today, like I just left, we're in the Eastern Standard time. So, I left our church to come and join in while you guys were doing your worship time. And I was so reminded of something the Lord showed me a couple of years ago. He showed me our um our church auditorium and all the way around the auditorium were these doors and um there were congregations in each one of these doors and you guys were singing some of the same songs we love and you had the same spirit of love in the lord that we did and i just was so reminded like all across the earth like larry prayed how incredible it is that like his body truly does cover the earth and those those distances are being cut short through technology i mean i'm in pennsylvania right now and I think it is awesome that we get to connect. Um, I don't know. I just think that's amazing. So God, I just ask that as I share my heart, that there would be no distance, that Holy Spirit would just connect um, us heart to heart and spirit to spirit, and that there would be no delay at all. It would be like an instant connection heart to heart, um, and that you would just meet in the middle. I just think that would be awesome. So thank you. So I grew up in Bible Belt. I don't know, does Colorado know the term Bible Belt? Do you know what that is? Yeah, okay. So we are major Bible Belt here. My aunts, three of my aunts and uncles live in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which is where there's a huge concentration of Amish. But um, in our area, there's um, lots of brethren, lots of um, um, old order river brethren, and even like they called them dunkards, like really old religious roots here, lots of old denominations. And so I actually grew up Mennonite. I had, um, um, I actually still have relatives that wear really conservative, um, um, you know, that's their, that's what they prefer. That's how they prefer to express their, their, their um, beliefs. And um, I had a little bit more of a up, graded or not upgraded, but a newer version of men. Like our, our parking lots had colored cars in them and not just black. Um, it was pretty, it's pretty extreme here in some places, how they express their, their faith. And um, in the church, we can be pretty hard on religious, like especially old religious um, roots. We can have real strong opinions and we can even throw out like religious spirit real uh, early. And sometimes I think we're just too hard on these ones that have carried traditions for really long periods of time. And so I have lots of respect um, in my heart for these older um, denominations. Like I, you'll you'll laugh sometimes. Like if you see me with a hymn, sometimes I'm just bawling because I just think there's um, such beauty in all of these different generations. But I was so privileged um, to grow up in a in a lineage of believers, and so I was I was a believer very early in my life. Like I've known the Lord, I would say my whole life. Um, but then, like as an early adult, the Lord put me in an environment that really taught me that I was a believer, but not a believer. I don't know how else to phrase that. Like I, I knew that Jesus was real. I'd made a decision for Christ, all of those things. But when it came to the aspects of his nature, like um, the, what's that new worship song that just came out? Like, you are good. Like if you had said to me, you are good, like God is good. I'd been like, okay, God's good. So so what, you know, um, like we talk about his faithfulness so much or his mercy or all of these things. And I think the Lord had to bring me into this time where I was like, okay, girl, you might call yourself a believer. You might be a Christian. You might do pretty fun things in my name from time to time, but you're not, eh. 
Eh, there's lots of space here between what you say and what your heart sort of believes, like fully believes. Um, and so that is where this whole journey came out of. Um, so uh, when I was about, uh, um, I think I was 21 or 22 when Nick and I got married. We've been married almost 15 years now. It'll be 15 years this year. Um, and so we're rookies. I'm sure some of you in the room are like, please, you're just getting started. But for, for us, that's like, we made it 15 years. This is great. Um, but we were like, we're about uh, two years into our marriage and everything was falling apart. Like there was no um, divorce in my family. There was no divorce in his family. And yet we were not doing well at all. Um, and so we went through this really difficult time of trying to salvage our marriage. And I thought I had gone through maybe some of the worst pain I could ever feel in terms of marriage issues and, and all of this stuff. You know, you're young and you think it's all, you know, it's just the worst it's ever going to be. And then um, we had children and we, that sort of got more complicated, and, but our marriage was solid. And so um, the Lord kind of decided, I guess, I guess he thought it was time. I don't know how else to phrase it. Um, but he put me in the family I'm in here in, in Chambersburg and uh, started to bring up this revelation of God as father. And I know you guys have all heard that. You're in Larry's congregation crying out loud. That is not new revelation. Um, but for me, it was new that God was my father. I knew lots of other things about God, but God is my father was a new one. And I had a good dad. I was pretty confident that I knew what it meant to be a daughter. Like I had been loved and nurtured and all of these things. But something was missing. And uh, uh, Mark came into my life and one or two other dads and moms came into my life. And I started to feel this burn to sort of submit my life to them. And I'm, I've always been sort of a stronger personality. I've always been kind of... Um, you can't break me. Like I've told my children, like I've got a, a son of mine who's pretty hyperactive and pretty crazy and I love him to pieces. But if he's stubborn, I'm like, you, you're not gonna, I'm stubborner than you. Like keep, go as far as you want. When you're done, I will be stubborner than you. So don't worry. I've never felt like I could break. And, um, but as I started submitting my life and I started to be like, okay, I really want to be a daughter, like in every sense of the word, I want to know in my heart what it is to be daughter of the Lord, like a full on mature son of the Lord. And I want to know what that looks like, because I don't think I've got it. Like I've heard it and I believe it and it sounds cool, but something is missing. Like the form of sonship that I have in my life has no power attached to it. I'm still too shaky. I'm still too insecure. Um, I'm still too nervous. I've still got all the ticks I learned, like um, one of the things about growing up in a super religious environment is there are control issues. And I grew up with control issues. Like we have to script everything. We have to control it all. And if it doesn't go how we want, now we have to manipulate it to be what we want it to be. Um, so all of these things are functioning in my life. I also had a huge amount of pride um, that caused me to... Uh, well, if I couldn't control it, I would avoid it because pride was a major factor. I was not willing to look like an idiot or to be awkward in any way. So here I am with all of this stuff now rising up in front of my heart. And I know it's in the way between me and the Lord. And I just didn't know what to do. So I submitted my life to, to some spiritual fathers. And um, over that time, the Lord took me through a breaking. And it was the course of about... Uh, I think it was about five years. Um, and it started slowly to the point that I thought, oh, this is amazing. I'm like learning new things. And as long as you can keep the revelations of the Lord cerebral, they don't have to change anything. You can, so you can even develop behaviors around the things you're learning of the Lord that never touch your heart. You just act differently. And it's like, a, it's almost a form of bullying. Like um, my children are young and they're in elementary schools. And so of course, bullying is a major um, topic right now in the school systems, at least in our area. And I don't think we as adults are all that different with ourselves. I think we become very good at bullying our behaviors to fit the new thing we're learning instead of doing the hard work or the deeper or the longer work of letting our heart be fully excavated and transformed. 
And that is an altogether different process. And it's an altogether control, like you cannot control it and you can't negotiate it. And it's always awkward and it always hurts and it's confusing and disorienting. And it just so happened that the Lord decided to do that with like six different parts of my personality all at the same time. And so at one point I just felt like I was on fire. I didn't know how else to make it stop. Um, and truthfully, I was, I, I went through a time of fighting it all. I thought, well, at least if as, you know, we're going through this together and, I, and my fathers are helping me through it. And sometimes they're instigating confrontations where they would say, you know what, we love you. We see this thing in your life. You really need to look at it. I thought I'll model having a mind of my own. Like, of course, I'm going to submit and listen, but I'll model having a mind of my own if I fight a little bit. Like if I put up a little bit of a push, you know, I'm going to question a little. I'm going to demonstrate my, like, I've thought of that, but this is why I don't. And like trying to look like I had some form of control, um, that I was smart. Like I didn't need help. <laughs> I don't know how else to phrase that. Um, and at one point, actually, it was very interesting last week, um, short story last week, uh, my, my daughter has a cat who she loves more than most people. She loves this cat with her life. She's nine years old. Um, it's her best friend. And so we need to get the cat some shots and fix them. The whole thing is to that age. And so we took the cat to the vet and on the way home, I guess the cat was very nervous or something, but he soiled his box and it's a whole scene in the car. And so now my husband's away and I'm like, oh no, I have to give this cat a bath. And I've never given a cat a bath before, but I have seen the internet videos and I knew I was going to die and I didn't know what else to do, but I couldn't, I'm kind of funny about cat smell out in my house anyway. I'm like, I have to take care of this right now. I can't stand it. So Allie and I go down to the basement and we're trying to give this pat who, cat who is not declawed, by the way, a bath. And it was this is horrible, horrible 15 minutes of time. And at the end, this cat was trying to kill me. I don't know how else to put it. It wanted, it wanted my face. It wanted all of me. It wanted gone. And we had the cat all soaked up and could not rinse him. We could not get soap off. We, we were stuck. And so I said, Allie, I got it. I'm going to fill this up. Uh, we had one of those big utility sinks in our basement. I said, I'm going to fill this sink with water halfway. And I'm going to say one, two, three, and you're going to throw the cat in. And that's how we're going to rinse him. And if he runs out, then that's good. You got most of the soap, the soap out and he'll, you know, the rest will be out later. So one, two, three, Allie, there's the cat in the sink. We run this way. The cat took off this way. And at one point, right toward the end, he bit my arm. And I have this huge bruise and bite on my arm. And that's how I was while the Lord was trying to, like, um, clean me up. <laughs> The Lord was trying to polish me. He was loving me. He was trying to make me better. Like he was trying to clear me completely off. Like this brand new daughter. He was doing all of this faithful work in me. And I was biting and scratching and clawing and trying to demonstrate I didn't need this. And at some point, I just realized I can't negotiate this. He's going to get like, okay, I don't know how to. God always submits to our no. Like if I had said, no, I'm out. I'm not listening. I'm not doing this. I'm going around this mountain again. He would have honored me. But I've always said I wanted all of the Lord. I've always said I wanted his whole heart. I've always said I wanted to be a full daughter. I didn't want to be double-minded or um, like, you know, you know, James even calls us double-minded. I didn't want two different nations warring inside of me. I didn't want spirit and flesh, like two little things on my shoulders all the time. I wanted to become so good at knowing his voice that I could trust what came out of my heart and trust what was in my mind and trust how I parented and trusted my husband in my marriage and trusted the people around me in my community. And I got tired of fighting it all the time. I wanted only the Lord and all the Lord. And I knew that if I said no, or I said not yet, or if I said wait or any of those things, the Lord would honor me. And I didn't, I didn't, I was scared he'd honor me. <laughs> <laughs> and give me the room that would actually keep me back from being everything I wanted to be. And so um, at one point, I even put this, this scripture on the back of my book, but at one point I found this scripture in Psalm 51, and you guys can turn there if you want to. We're used to the NAS um, here in Chambersburg, but I don't know what you guys normally do. Um, but in Psalm 51, 6, it says, Behold, you desire truth in my innermost being. And in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. And I 
I had observed in others and I was observing in myself that there's too, there was too much, uh, too many lies, too much negotiation, too much confusion. Like, I think when we really know the heart of our father and the voice of our father, some of the things that mess with us lose their authority. And I had too many confusing things in my mind and too many um, coping mechanisms uh, like, for instance, my grandfather, he has passed now, but he was always very sort of socially um, wonderful. He was funny and he had dentures and he'd pop his dentures out at us. And he was just this wonderful guy, but he was always nervous he would overstay his welcome. He was always scared that he would stay five minutes past when anybody wanted him to. So he had this nervous tick when he was with the family. He'd say, come on, mom, let's go five minutes before anybody wanted him to leave. And that was how he'd say to grandma. He'd say, hey, come on, mom, let's go. And grandma would be there hugging grandchildren or, or talking or she would be totally surrounded by these this mountain of family she loved so much. And grandpa would say, come on, mom, let's go five minutes before anybody could wish grandpa would go. That was his nervous tick. It's how he would make sure nobody ever wanted him to go. He left before he had ever stayed as welcome. And I had so many of that kind of thing in our, in my life. And we all do like, we don't recognize how many things we do just to avoid the awkward moment we're deliberately avoiding or like the um, value, the um, lack of self value that we're expressing or the um, insecurities we have in our relationships or the nervousness we have with different things. We send, we, we, we do all kinds of things. I could go into it, but Psalm says you desire truth in the innermost being. And when I, when I read that word truth, it is accuracy. It is the lack of lies, but it's almost a, um, I mean, anytime the Lord is present, it is, it's a security. It's a weighted, stable presence in our innermost. And in the inner part, you make me to know wisdom, purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. And I think if memory serves, hyssop was like a disinfectant. Um, and that's how it was being with the Lord. It was like um, when I was a child and we rode our bikes on around the gravel sideway, the gravel driveway, we had this huge driveway on the farm. And we'd go around the gravel, gravel driveway and we'd skid out, you know, like you go around too fast and you just lose the bike and you slide for 20 feet and we tear up our knees. And I don't know, did any of your parents pour peroxide? right on there. Like that was the cure, right? But thank you, Larry. So like my mom would just dump peroxide on there and we'd scream and it would foam. And that's how it felt like, oh, it's a laxative. Oh, that's even not, that's scary. That's how it felt though. Ronnie said that hyssop is a laxative and now I'm like, that's even worse. <laughs> anyway, purify me with hyssop. I mean, get it out. Um, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Um, make me to hear joy and gladness. And then here was the line that made me feel like the Lord knew me or like David really understood me. He said, let the bones, which you have broken rejoice. And it never occurred to me, the Lord might love me by breaking me. Um, and I think we often have the Lord offering those moments to us, but we deliberately sort of avoid them because we would rather not break. <laughs> um, break being broken by the lord is such a holy thing only a loving father can do that properly only a loving father can heal us properly but when he breaks us he's actually not honoring where we are as much as what he knows he made us to be and it's such a loving position to be in but i didn't they let the bones which you have broken rejoice was this asinine concept that it would that I would rejoice that the, that the broken parts of me would rejoice but in that moment I stopped fighting I don't know how else to express to you that it gave me peace that I could sit back and let the Lord do what he was doing in my life and I could entirely submit to what he was doing in my life and he would heal it he's never once left us broken if we if we're still broken it's because he's walking us through healing or because we're learning to understand who he is so that our heart does heal but he doesn't deliberately just let us there in 60 pieces he puts us back together and so many times when he puts us back together that thing is undeniably healthier than it ever was before and it is so full of life and it's become a testimony to the people around us and it's become a source of light to people that knew us the old way and so they sort of look at us um, it's like that dog's expression, I'm like, what? what's happening in you now? I don't recognize this thing. But the beautiful part about what the Lord did is he put me in a community that could tolerate that kind of um, um, love, and uh, you know, that kind of love. Like if the Lord starts breaking you, 
you lash out. You start saying things you mean, but they're not good. And they're not true either. Like you just say horrible things or you send horrible texts or you vent. <laughs> Who among us has not vented before to somebody we trust that you're like, I don't like you very much. And I think that was horrible. And you were really mean to me. And that wasn't holy. And that's not the Lord. And you start throwing out all of this. And it's coming up from inside and you didn't know it was there. And it's this precious time of like cleansing. You know, it's this precious cleansing. So Larry said you could read something from your book and I want, if you want to, and I wasn't going to, but then last night I was thinking about this and um, this one came to me and it's actually my, probably the closest one to my heart in the book. And it's the last one. So I'll just read it to you because it expresses this time perfectly for me. Um, but it's called like vampires in the sun. Um, and it starts, I was littered. Everywhere I looked, mortar shells of suspicion had torn black holes in my relationships. Within me were toxic holes of offense toward many I said I loved. When Jesus, looked, when Jesus saw this place, his eyes were kind but sad. Here and there were the twisted walls I'd built, a city of doom half constructed and built on foundations of imaginary accusation. Hazards where Jesus stumbled when he came to find me. When I saw his crucified feet patiently moving around my many illusions and judgments to carve a path to me, my heart broke. So I began excavating every cratered thing over and over and over, opening my heart, quivering and shaking, standing and learning, failing and winning. I'm making it sound like work, but truly Jesus did it. My entire effort was to stay open and not run. When I caught myself arguing with the imagined and invisible, I repented immediately, turned myself to Jesus and said, okay, this is you and me. Let's tear this stronghold down. Remind me about this precious person. Expand your love in me for what is real. Source me in this. Show me where you are in this. Discipline me. Search me. Help me to test my emotions and affix to you as truth. I hide nothing and I fear no one. I am beautiful and loved and highly valued. This is you and me. Let's, let's talk. And I experience extraordinary freedom and gentle clarity. And yet some places of me simply would not submit. I laid them open to the light, waiting for them to burn to ash like vampires in the sun, waiting to be loved, reproved, and rebuilt, waiting to be told where I was wrong, where I had faltered, what needed fixing so that I could heal or so that I could stop hurting. I thought that if I could just get them to Jesus, if I could just get these things to him, they'd come into context and lose their bite. Surely they would burn to ash in his gaze and float away. But there seemed to be a pickaxe in my hands. I seemed to be like a miner, slicing through black ore and hitting solid rock. The hammer clanged and recoiled. And I could not figure out why these things, these firm, unyielding tendons, these things embedded in me would not yield to Jesus. If anything, they became unspeakably more pronounced, immune to death. I begged for their destruction. I, reject, I rejected them out of loyalty to Jesus, but they refused to die. They stood stubbornly within me as though constructed of immortal fibers, not consenting to dismissal. And it dawned on me. What if those things weren't meant to go? After all this unreserved dismantling, what if I finally hit the core? What if these things that would not die were made of life? Had I discovered the fortresses of Jesus? Had I found my foundation? Had I discovered something I could keep? Covered in mud, I leaned back and brushed my brow, breathing hard, streaks across my face, I peered down, testing and mistrusting any idea that I would deliberately fail to tear down my enemy. But there it was, peeking through the sediment, a footer of solid gold, grimed and gleaming. 
I sat down, sank back, and wept. And that's how that period started to shift for me. The Lord started taking these pieces of my heart. Like it, for a time, I literally felt like I could keep nothing. I, I couldn't keep anything. I had to take literally every thought, literally every instinct, every word I wanted to say, every judgment, every single detail. It was like, it was exhausting, but I had to take everything to Jesus and be like, what do you think about this? And Mark taught me this incredible sentence, taught all of us this incredible sentence. Um, And it came out during that time. And it was just the best uh, for me at that time. The question was, what's going on inside of you? And I started to ask myself that question all the time. What's going on inside of me? Where is this coming from? Where is it sourced? What is, what, what will it produce? What kind of a seed is it? Is it death? Is it life? Like looking at all of it. And it was this precious moment of the Lord saying, okay, you know, eventually it was like, no, that one's that one you get to keep. <laughs> that one I put there. You've been digging through all of this junk and all of this stuff that you learned in, you know, in school and in life and in your friends and all of this stuff and in the hardships and in the people you spend time with. All of these things you've gleaned and added to your life. You've dug them out <laughs> and they're being removed. And that part, you know, you would bring something up, some kind of a negative emotion. And I would say, Lord, I feel annoyed by this. Why do I feel this way? And he'd be like, because it's not holy. I made you a person of justice. That's how I made you to be. You shouldn't be annoyed by that. And I was like, I, I get, I get to keep this. <laughs> this is a holy thing you put into me. This is something, this is part of the DNA you gave me. This is, I get to keep it. Like I started to have these moments and, you know, it blips on the radar of, oh my golly, like God put really good things in me. I get to keep this and something else, you know, um, I have young ones and, I would be so passionate about something or so annoyed by something. You'd be like, Lord, why am I so annoyed by this? Or that you can tell annoying is a major one I have to deal with. But like, why am I so passionate about this? Or why do I, why am I so upset by it? Or why does this hurt my heart? And every once in a while, he'd be like, because that is who I made you to be. Because that is who I am. And you are so passionate about what I care about. And slowly, it's like this. Um, I tried to think about how to do this for you people so that it's not backwards. But it's like a needle goes from like this. And so much is wrong. And slowly, so much is right. And so much heals. And so much is restored. And so much has um, authority in it and passion in it. And it got to be like we would sing these songs we love. Like we would sing like, you are good. And I would bawl. Like I would legit fall and not because I was hurting, but because I saw how good the Lord was. Like he had gone into the worst things of, of my, what the, you know, for me now, the worst thing I'd ever experienced. And he had made it glorious and he had finished and he never didn't finish. And I was so thankful to be the daughter of the Lord. And we would sing, you are good. And I'd be like, oh my God, you are so good. And I would just be on the floor weeping. And I could do it right now, but wasn't trying to hold it together for you all. But like, He's so good. And like faithfulness and like um, uh, faithfulness was a key one because I even said, you know, my entire effort was stay open and do not quit. Quit. Look, Americans have an abnormal ability to quit. And I think it's because we're so free and so independent and so able to be whatever we want to be. And sometimes we equate hurt with time to quit. And I had a lot of that inside of me. It hurt, so it was time to quit. And when the Lord took away, I don't know, I can't express any differently. He took away for a time my right to quit. Um, And so I went through many things that I was so angry at that I did not want to do, that I was literally kicking and screaming different things in my life that I I did because the Lord did not let me quit, not because they were any part of my holy identity, not because I was called to them, not because I had some kind of a righteous, you know, cross-bearing moment other than the Lord was deleting my quit mechanism so that I would push through, so that I would continue in other places. There's so much in the earth. There's such a cry for justice. There's such a cry for holiness. There's such a cry for purity and truth in the earth. And we quit too fast. We get upset too fast. We check out too quick and we don't show this holy 
um, abiding love to people that desperately need to experience it because look, it's like so many of us, our jobs is that thing. Like so many times I'll be talking to somebody and they'll be like, I hear what you're saying, except not my job. Like I'm leaving my job at the earliest opportunity because I, these coworkers that I am with, they're ridiculous. Or like, you know, I was just with somebody last weekend and they were telling me about this woman that she literally can't stand at her job. And we had been talking about loving our enemies and she's like, you don't understand. I can't love this woman. Like I can love anybody else in the earth, but I can't love this woman. And I think sometimes our coworkers or the people in our workplaces, they kind of fall into that category. They're like, look, Lord, everywhere else in my life, I will love people. But these people that I'm with eight hours a day or 10 hours a day or whatever, like I can't stand them. I can't stand my boss. I can't sell this thing. And we tend to leave places of influence the Lord has given us really too soon sometimes those moments are like those are the purifying moments where the lord is like i want to show you who i am there in these i'm trying to put this in holy words but look sometimes people are just hard people are i think people are hard they they hit our buttons they know our pressure points they have different backgrounds than we do or sometimes these people are just deeply wounded in a million areas and you don't even know where to start like they just they're they're broken and they're hurting and i think sometimes we just quit too soon so the lord like literally took away my quitting mechanism like for i um i cannot count I literally cannot count the number of times I wanted to quit. And he literally would not allow me to um, just for a period of time until I learned what it was to go in the Lord, to be like, um, and hopefully the Lord is still teaching me this because this is a really hard one, but like, no matter how bad I want to quit, no matter how angry I am, no matter how frustrated or confused or disillusioned or exhausted I am by this environment, it is incredibly empowering to be able to learn to go to the Lord in that place and to be supernaturally, abundantly sourced by his spirit in those places. And quitting cuts that off. It's like a chicken exit on a roller coaster ride. Like just before you get on the roller coaster ride, there's that little gate. It's like you, were, you waited in line for two hours, but now you really regret it and you're out. Like that's sort of what quit can be for us. Like we're just getting ready to really have this full um, experience of being sourced by the Lord and we hit the quit just then. Um, and so I think that's that's just one thing. So that's where that came out of. And it was this incredible time, but slowly I got to keep more pieces. You know, you get to you, more and more and more and stuff is refined. And um it's, it's actually interesting now because I, I, lately I felt like I'm revisiting some of the things that, um, that, I, you know, um, that I thought I had learned. And so many times it's like, no, you have to renew again. Like there is no in the Lord's like, no, I've arrived. Like, okay, I'm not in kindergarten anymore. I'm in, I'm in first grade. I'm not a bachelor's candidate anymore. I'm a master's candidate. I'm getting my doctorate in the Lord. No, <laughs> because over and over again, we need to like, we're constantly rooted in him. And we're like, okay, Lord, teach me again. Show me again. Remind me again. Help me to look at it with brand new eyes. Let me look at it like my kids look at it. Let me have that kind of childlike faith. I don't want to be seasoned in your presence. I don't want to be um, so sober in front of you or so like, um, um, like, stoic or like postured or very um structured in front of you i want to be like like the heart because he's so drawn to childlike hearts he's so drawn to broken hearts he's so drawn to honest hearts so I, I want my heart to be like that in front of you not stiff but like yearning and leaning in and passionate about what you're passionate about and if i'm not break me again do not let me calcify <laughs> do not let me be like um uh uh What's it called when tree turns into rock? Petrified. Don't let me petrify. I don't, I want to be a living example of your light. Not like something that's turning to stone just because it's been there for so long. Like constantly breathing and living your life. So um, I just wanted to share that first. And then I wanted to share a little bit. The Lord has been showing me. Um, okay. So if you go to 1 Corinthians uh, 4, um, if you feel like it, I can just read it too. It's up to you. But I'm starting in verse 14. Okay. I want to make sure that that's the right. Yeah. So in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, Paul is, he's gone on for like three and a half chapters about stuff that he wanted to really kind of correct in the, in the Corinthian church. And he's being such a loving dad, but he's also being very strong. Um, 
So we get to these verses in 1 Corinthians 4, and you guys have heard them a hundred times. I just want to share something I found. Um, he says, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I exalt, exhort you, be imitators of me. So I was in a coffee shop one day and I was just studying this and it was one of those couple of hour blips where I had no children. So I was like, like soaking up all my time. And I was reading this verse and I went to the Greek to kind of understand what this word tutors was. And I had never done this before, but I'm going to just share with you briefly. So in the Greek, that word tutors is the word pedagogue. Okay. Pedagogue. And I was like, okay, that feels like that might be something I need to like follow. So I did. I followed it on Google. And guys, I have no business on academic websites whatsoever. Just let me tell you, I went there scary because it's just lots of information. I don't know what to do with it. But I found this academic website that had this whole paper about what a pedagogue was. And I was like, oh my gosh, they're going to tell me this Greek history. A pedagogue was a slave, most often a slave, that was trusted by the father of a young boy to uh, basically be his guardian. Um, in Greek or Roman culture, the fathers, the father of these young boys, first of all, birth rate was terrible. So if you had a young son, this was a big deal. And you, he was like, especially aristocratic boys, like uh, have a boy heir who survives and is doing well, good, we're keeping him, this is important. But a father's first job or first priority in that culture wasn't being a dad. It wasn't being at home and raising his boys or his children. His first priority in his mind was military, um, in the Senate, like a political thing, business things. Those were his first instincts. And so to give himself peace of mind um, uh, as he was doing all these things to make sure his boy was being raised up properly, he would assign to his young son a pedagogue. That usually happened around six or seven years old. And the purpose of this pedagogue was literally um, constant companionship. So like he followed the boy to school. He stayed with him at school and made sure he listened to his teachers, um, made sure he behaved properly. If the boy misbehaved, it was the pedagogue's fault and not the boy's fault. Um, it was considered obvious that a boy would make a mistake, but the pedagogue should have known better. So if the boy misbehaved, it was the pedagogue's fault. Uh, followed the boy home from school, was his first line of information if he needed to know anything, made sure he was always safe, made sure he was always cared for. He was like the moral authority for that boy. So if the boy was not growing up with proper integrity or character, um, it was the pedagogues to get on that. And the pedagogue stayed with this boy until the t this boy became a man and was trusted to reason for himself, such that I even found out that um, one of the Caesars, I think it was Claudius, still had his pedagogue when he took the throne, when he took the Caesar throne, you know what I mean? When he became Caesar, uh, he still had his pedagogue because he was not yet trusted to reason for himself. Um, now that's faded later and he became a champion of the law and the whole thing. But the point being that the pedagogue essentially became like tutor slash guardian slash support player for the young boys. In the Greek culture and aristocratic, every young boy had one in a Roman family. I think that's how it was. They shared each family shared a pedagogue, but these are major roles in this boy's life. You can imagine how the boy would attach to a pedagogue who was with him all the time. And a lot of the philosophers even referred to their pedagogues in some of their writings. It was just part of their mind growing up. But what's so interesting is Paul is telling us not to cling to pedagogues. And we tend to um, treat the teachers um, in our church like that. Or like even like on the internet, like because it's everywhere now. We can click and watch a video. We can click and listen to a sermon. Like there's so much teaching in the church right now, which is great because there's so much revelation. We love it. But Paul's like, don't cling to pedagogues. Like I know that's how you were taught in that school, but you were raised with a father. Like and he even says to the point, like I became your father through the gospel. Imitate me. Like imitate me. It's really confident of any spiritual dad to be like, look, seriously, follow my example. It's insanely confident. I don't know how many, like, even in the room, how it would be like, yeah, I'm confident enough to tell like, a group of believers, an entire church in a city to follow my example. <laughs> Paul was confident. He knew he had the heart of the Lord. He's like, no, seriously, you don't, you have countless tutors in Christ. You have countless, but you don't have many fathers. Find a father, attach, listen to the heart of the Lord and the voice of the Lord, attach. You have 
um, imitate your fathers. And so it was so interesting to me. Like, I really felt like I was hearing from the Lord this word breadcrumbs. And I know that's weird, but just go with me. Breadcrumbs. Um, and you know the story of Hansel and Gretel? Like, I don't know it very well, and it doesn't work up really great. But the point being that the breadcrumbs led them home. Um, it was so interesting to me how I think the Lord is taking this time, like each of us personally, to father us and to put fathers in our lives to help us develop a confident represent representation of who he created us to be in the earth. And what we tend to do now is we tend to look like the people we spend time with. Like we tend to share vocabularies with the church that we are involved in. We tend to share, like even in our jobs, like a lot of us, you learn a vocabulary at work so that you can share the job, right? Like you know how to abbreviate things, you know how to communicate things on the fly, and you become a really fast team. And we tend to do that in our communities. We tend to look and dress and, and share priorities with the people we're in community with. And I think sometimes we actually cut the representation of the Lord short in our communities because we don't necessarily explore the full manifestation of what he put inside of us. We just link it up with the people around us. And so we miss some of the more vibrant, dynamic uh, expressions of what the Lord has fully in mind for us. Like none of us were created um, boring. We were not created vanilla. We were cruel. Well, maybe some of us are vanilla. My, my father-in-law says that's not a favor. He says if there's not something in your vanilla, you don't actually have ice cream. Um, but the point being, like, we were created with all of this, like, dynamic, crazy, like, if you look at the earth, there's some insanity. Watch a nature show sometime and look at how many different spiders there are. Like, it's, creation's insane and people are like that. We are very diver diverse people. And I think the Lord, like, I feel urgently that the Lord wants us to be more diligent about recognizing the breadcrumbs he has put in our lives to fully develop in our hearts and minds what he's showing us as people on the earth and as part of our communities. For instance, have you ever had a worship song stuck in your head for three days? Have you ever had a song stuck in your head for three days? Have you ever had a conversation with a friend and they said a sentence and you literally thought about it over and over after they were done? Or you start to see, um, this is a dumb one, I don't know what I would do with it, but you start to see yellow cars everywhere. Or you suddenly decide, decide that there needs to be this invention and it doesn't exist. Why doesn't it exist? Well, surely it's a bad idea because nobody has made it, you know? Like there's these little breadcrumbs everywhere and the Lord started to show me, like for instance, did you, do we remember um, when Jesus was taking the last supper with his disciples and he broke the bread and he handed them all a piece? Like I think the Lord is constantly putting before us these really personal hints, breadcrumbs, tips, guides, like little things that if we follow them, we will find our own um, uh, I don't want to say, okay, I'm going to say it, then I'm going to fix it. We're going to find our own revelation of the Lord, meaning he begins to teach us himself. And then when we come together, we're all like, you have to hear what the Lord taught me this week about his heart. You have to hear how passionate the Lord is about truth. You have to understand how crazy excited God is about the state of Utah right now. I don't know, but like, I think there will be all of this craziness rising up in our family. And then I think the connection points between us becomes real partnerships of passion. Like I think I have this heart about this and I'm, I'm obsessed about this right now. And then you start sending each other messages because you're like, you know how you said you saw 11 yellow cars? Well, I just saw six more at Walmart. Or like, you know what I mean? Like you start to partner in these really personal ways with each other and the revelation of God starts going like this and it's this bursting swelling well in our communities um uh they're in in the wilderness when Jesus was being tempted by Satan and uh and Satan says just command those rocks to become bread Jesus, you know, we all know this. Jesus said, I don't live by bread alone. I live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In Deuteronomy, that's Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy. Um, the words there, I live by every, uh, every, everything. I live by everything that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's literally like this indication that out of the heart and the mouth of God toward us is constantly coming these revelations of his heart, these personal 
Um, okay, look, no one can teach you or father you like the Lord can. No one can. No one knows the full scope of the life that you've lived and all the relationships and all of the experience that have led you to where you are right in this moment. So the Lord is insanely genius at connecting with you and leading you. And it will not be solely from the methods we're used to learning from him as. It won't always just be from our pastor and Sunday morning. It won't always just be from, you know, whatever streams we have, our devotional time on, you know, on Tuesday mornings, whatever it is, it's going to start becoming in all of our lives this really diverse and personal trail of breadcrumbs. And it's almost like to the point where you're going to be like, Lord, I am drawn to the concept of compassion more than anything else in my life. So I'm going to start and you're going to teach me because I'm not a Bible scholar. I don't know Greek. I don't know where to do any of these things, but I know how to Google. And I'm, I'm starting somehow. I remember the first time, this was after a lot of the, the worst parts of my of my, well, we're in the middle somewhere. Anyway, point being, I was reading through the Bible. We had started, we had decided that we were going to read through the Bible in 90 days. By the way, don't do that. That's a terrible idea. If you're doing it right now, great. But it's literally like you're sprinting through the Bible. You, it's like, you're like, Lord, I think that was good, but see you later. Cause I got to get over here. Cause I got to be in like judges by tomorrow. Like it's, it's running fast, but we had committed to running through the Bible in 90 days. And I was somewhere in Psalms, just screaming past. And, um, and I kept seeing this word loving kindness. I'd seen it over and over and over and over and over again. I'm like, okay, this is just weird. Why are they using the word loving kindness? Why don't they either use the word love or kindness or anything else? But something like triggered in my heart, like there's something here. It was like a breadcrumb for me. And I had just was starting to learn to like, let the Lord teach me. And I actually ended up never finishing my commitment to read through the Bible in 90 days because I got literally stuck. I Googled loving kindness. I started to figure out where it had come from. And before you know it, the Lord had completely changed my understanding of his mercy and of his covenant nature with us. And it was, he taught me. He didn't like teach me through a YouTube video from whoever or whatever or wherever. Not that those are awful because I do that stuff all the time, but he taught me through a breadcrumb that no one else could have um, triggered in like a little bell so it's, I think it's to the point that the Lord is saying, literally, I'm going to start putting breadcrumbs in front of your feet and I need you to pick them up. And I don't know how you'll pick them up. Like I started a note in my phone and that's not working. So I have other ideas of how I'm going to start collecting these, these pictures of the Lord, these pieces of the Lord, but he is starting to like feed his people. He's feeding us well and generously. And it's like when we were in the wilderness and it's like he gives us enough manna for today. And he wants us to pick it up and fully take it into ourselves and be like, Lord, I totally got that. You get, when you send more, I'm going to eat more. I'm going to let you feed um, my life. I'm going to let you fuel it and source it. And somebody told me the other day, I haven't heard from the Lord the long, for a long time. And I was like, that's got to be crap. Because I knew they really loved the Lord. They just were started. They were still too pigeonholed and how it had to look. And we started talking and they said something about a conversation they'd had and it was bothering them and they just kind of kept moving on. I was like, um, go back there a minute. Tell me about that conversation again. And she's just shared it just briefly. She's like, she was literally walking over the breadcrumb as she told me, I said, you're telling me that that bothered you, like that, that, that line or that sentence or that word or whatever. She said, yeah, but I don't really know, like whatever. And I said, stop right there. That's it. Pick it up. Do something with it. She said, I don't know what to do with it. I said, I, I don't know either. Start asking the Lord. Like, start Googling. I know that Googling is how my generation solves every question in the world. We just Google and we see what the first 10 results are. We're like, surely there's something there. But, like, we all have our way of asking questions. We have people we can go to. We have... We have the Lord. We have the Holy Spirit who can talk to us. There will be a song on the radio. I just did a, I just edited a book for an author who literally the Lord talked to her while she was driving down the mountain through the radio to the point that he played the song twice and, re and flipped words in the song to talk to her. And she didn't pick up till later that that's not how the song actually went. Like he talked to her through the FM channel. It was amazing. And he's that committed and personal and wants to talk to us, like us, so badly. And then he wants that to 
spring out. Like when it's a spring up, oh well, spring up. Like let it come out of what he's doing inside of you. And not everybody is like me and wants to like talk and communicate and, and emote and express. Not everybody's gonna write a book, but there's like, there are people in your life that you do not even know how shattered they would be for you, like good shattered. <laughs> good shattered for you, they'd be for you to come up and be like, I just, can I just tell you two minutes of what I'm learning about mercy or what I'm learning about light or what I'm learning about, you know, I don't know, whatever, whatever the breadcrumb is. It's not even, it's not always a Bible word. <laughs> it can be anything. The Lord is crazy creative. So moral of that being, uh, a friend of mine is named Steve, and he uh, led me to this book series he wanted me to read, and it was about how they, sort of a fictional account of how the first century church might have looked based on the first couple books of the epistles, and um, so on, and I just read them because he recommended them, and he's one of the dads in my life, I was like, okay, here we go, um, and I was reading, and I started to understand how the gospels came to, came to be, the Matthew, Mark, Luke and John books that they were literally eyewitness accounts of um, this, the life of Jesus that these people could then share. Like it was, it was a huge deal to have eyewitness accounts of the life, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And in some cases, you know, the ascension of Jesus um, written down. And like these people are like, Oh my gosh, this is like, um, I don't know whoever writes a book now of like a real life story. This is the real life story of Jesus. I have this in my hands. I have this in the, you know, in the synagogue and the Lord, as I was like reading all this, the Lord was like, that's what we do with breadcrumbs. We start writing the gospel of our life. We start saying, yes, I have met the Lord. I have absolutely resurrected in his life. And this is what he looks like to me. This is what he's like. This is how the earth needs to experience the Lord. I am here for such a time as this. And I'm not going to let the revelation of Holy Jesus, Holy Father, Holy Spirit in me go to the grave with me. I am going to, as far as it is with me, as, as he created me to, I'm going to write the gospel of my life. And I'm going to share it. And I'm going to pour it out. And I'm going to let, why ever the Lord wanted me to see him in this way, I'm going to let it fill the lives of people. I'm going to let it galvanize them and excite them and um, maybe sometimes irritate them, maybe sometimes inspire them. Who knows? You know, we don't always know what the effect of our life will be. But it's literally time to take all of these breadcrumbs, these hints of the Lord, these, these guiding um, anchor points of his heart in our relationship with him and let it write our personal, here's the Lord. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you what I've experienced of him. And then I think this whole concept of evangelism and making disciples and all of these instructions the Lord gave us takes on a super easy aroma because we don't have to try to do what's actually just already coming out of our hearts. It's not a discipline and it's not a command. It's more like, a, oh, you can't stop me. I'm going to tell you what I've seen because I saw the Lord. It's like when Mary saw Lord, I saw him, I saw him. Like that comes out of us. And then out of us comes this bursting, um, unique, creative, dynamic. Some of us, it might be quiet. Some of us, it might be, you know, whatever it is. If I start listing, it would be here for two years. But like the point being, like I'm convinced that in all of our natures, like in all of our, not all of our natures, in all of our communities, we look too much alike. And it's time for us to start allowing all the differences among us to shine and to be brilliantly manifested and welcomed among us. <laughs> so I'm about done, Larry. What would you like to do next? Well, no, I, I, this is fantastic. So just let me, uh, let me bring a little context to the folks here. When we first moved here, Diane, the, the series that the Lord put on my heart and the purpose of, of the transfer down here to Springs and stuff was, here's some things you have to do to find your voice. <laughs> okay. And you guys agree that, that uh, Diane has expressed that concept better than anything we've done so far here. So we got some mics right here and here. And would you mind taking some questions? I can try. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was fantastic. Good. I'm glad. That was fantastic. Um, would you say there at the end that we all look too much alike? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. Amen. Anybody got any questions? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Look at the room. Any questions? Anybody have a, a little breadcrumb or a passion they'd like to share? See what it might turn into? <laughs> They'll get warmed up in just a second. Oh, it takes time. It's okay. I'm the guy that doesn't look like anybody else. Go for it, Ronnie. Okay. When you were talking about, um, I forget who was teaching you, probably your pastor. Yeah. Ask what's going on on the inside. Was that it? Your yeah, pastor? what's going on inside of you. Yeah. Right. That's similar to um, an expression that we got from, or I got from a book called, um, what's that book called, Terry? Art. The Master Heart Course or something like that? Yeah, but I forget the name of the book. Anyways, the question to ask is your heart, asking your heart, how are you doing? <laughs> and realizing the things that are in your heart are what's driving the conversation in your mind, and mm -hmm. your body and around you and things like mm -hmm. that. So very, very similar concept to, to what you were saying. And I think the important nature of that is we're very used to blaming others for what we're experiencing. And I think when you say what, what's going on here, it really forces us to take personal responsibility. And I think um, laying down the right to blame someone else for what I'm feeling inside is a sort of a stripping point because it's very easy. I'm sure as we all, it's very easy to blame somebody else, but what's going on inside of me or how are you feeling hard is awesome. Like, okay. in here, yeah, the, the book's called heart made whole. Now I remember heart made whole. Yeah. Who wrote it? Do you know? Rebecca uh, Gifford. What's her first name? Krista Black Gifford. Krista Black Gifford. Krista Black Gifford. Okay. Thank you. She has a course on it. It's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Matt? So, Diane, this is Matt McCloskey. Okay. You'll be on camera in just a sec. Hi, Dan. Hi. Thank you for sharing what you shared. And... I just had a question. I don't know how to word it, but um, you're just sharing about your marriage uh, before you kind of stepped into this. So I was just wondering, um, it's kind of personal, but I just was kind of wondering like where your husband's heart with is with all this, like where are yeah. you at now? And do you feel like this process that you went through, like how did it change your marriage or how's your marriage look now? So it's an awesome question. Okay. Um, give me a hot second to think. <laughs> um, okay, so when yeah, our marriage improved as my sonship improved uh, by a mile. Uh, when we married, I was, I am still very type A. I'm still very sort of uh, take the bull by the horns, impul not impulsive, but like I'm the one that has the ideas and I'm the one that plans the things and um, does all the things. And Nick has always been more um, agreeable and easygoing. Um, and when we married, he did not have many of his own opinions. And when I found that pretty agreeable to work with dating, found I found that frustrating in a marriage. And uh, But as my sonship improved, my honor of my husband improved. And I stopped um, trying to lead the person that the Lord actually gave me to care for me. And it forced me to open my heart to respecting him, um, to listening to his opinions and his decisions. And in some places I even had to learn to create the void and um, I'll open up uh, the room to tell him, I respect you so much that I'm actually not going to make a decision here. If you do not want to make a decision here, if you don't want to do anything here, then we will do nothing. I would rather be with you than um, place pressure points on our marriage or place all these decisions, like judgments about what I think you should be doing or all bossy or all controlling. As I lay down control, it's amazing how much Nick felt like he had more of a role in our family. Um, at the same time, you know, we had our children, Nick really stepped up as dad. And as I learned to appreciate who the Lord made my husband to be, I very much shifted in how I partner with him. And so now it's to the point that um, Nick is still 
I mean, Nick can voice an opinion now. Nick is a good leader. He's a good dad. He's all of those things, but even more so now he's still my head and he's still my strong side. So everything that I do, everything that I um, think of, like if I have a revelation, if I get a text from somebody, anything, Nick's always my first line and I hide nothing as far as I can from him. We have very different um, life schedules now. Like he actually works second shifts. So we like, we're like ships passing in the night during the week. So communication is always a little bit of a challenge, but uh, we, you know, as sonship, uh, took hold of my heart, I had to learn to trust him. I had to learn to let him lead. Um, and then when I learned to let him lead, it was amazing how much more room there was for me. And I didn't have to jostle for control and I didn't have to force him to let me be right. Like there was just room for me to partner with him. And so we could just be one unit. Um, I used to try to guilt him into things or, or tell him how I thought he should be and none of that ever worked. But it's amazing how much sonship um, in terms of letting the Lord, um, his nature become our heart. It's amazing how much that invites people to rise and how much is inside of them when we stop telling them what they should be. It's amazing what comes out. Um, and so Nick is an incredible leader now. He's my very best friend and he rises up in many ways. We are not always on the same level spiritually. Like I'm always the deeper thinker. Like I'm always the, the, uh, you know, Nick, uh, uh, he's the friend, he's easygoing, he's the listener. He's the safe place for many, many people. He's the one, if you're hurting, you're, he, you want the hug from him. I, it won't occur to me to hug you. <laughs> uh, Nick will be caring for you and loving on you. Um, but we're a really good team now because I think we just learned to let each other be son and daughter first and we're sourced by the Lord. And from that, we are one part and one marriage. And that's been a lot healthier. It was not healthy when I began and I would not have admitted that. I see it now, uh, but I wouldn't have said it then. Does that help you, Matt? Matt, right? <laughs> yeah, that was incredible. Thank you. Good. Good. <laughs> okay, Diane. Yeah. You have referenced something several times that uh, that I know a little bit about because I know you guys' community and I know you know how Mark's taught this stuff. But you've made statements like, "I really wanted to be fully a daughter," mm -hmm. and when I came into my sonship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's and, and this is not just for the ladies in the room. This is for the men as well. I think men have a, a tendency to embrace the concept of sonship more easily, but also more generally without specifically knowing what the heck's up. Right. And right. I, I think you guys have worked through it, and you specifically have worked through that idea. Mm -hmm. How do you, what is it about, so first of all, what is sonship as you understand it? And what is it about sonship that allows you to fully be a daughter mm -hmm. or a mom mm -hmm. or a, a, a wife, you know, that kind of thing? Yeah, it can be hard with the, with the boy-girl thing because I actually deeply care about masculinity and femininity. So I'm always like, oh man, like I don't know how to be a son and a daughter in the same sentence, but I know what I mean. So um, actually in the Greek and in the Hebrew culture, really there were two, there's several words, but I'm going to focus on two. One is technon, which is just the word for a child. Anybody can be a child. It's like when we say we're a child of God, of course we are, we are his own. Um, but there is an indicator in scripture of an of a, of additional term called huyos, it's H-U-I-O-S, um, and it refers to in the Jewish culture when a son became of age, they took on the full rank of a full heir of the Lord. And I think we really should do more in the church with differentiating those two things because we say we, uh, we love to say we're joint heirs and we're free and all these things in the Lord, but we're not actually until we have taken on the full heart of our father, because if we're still vulnerable to sin and we're still vulnerable to all of the, the things on the earth, like the flesh nature and stuff, I mean, you can say you're free and you're an heir, but you're not really because you're not living in this abundant life of the Lord. There's still too much jostling going on inside. But when you become an heir and a full-on son, which is the word he goes like grown, uh, fully received, like to the point that like a, a Huyos son in the Jewish culture could make business decisions on behalf of his father. He could bank with his father. He would like, it was when in the Jewish culture that father stood the son up beside him. I think it was like age 30. I don't, this is a little bit sketchy in my head. I could look this up a little better. I'm sorry. But to the point, he stood the son up beside him and say, treat him like you treat me. We are the same. Like we are 
equals not well not you know what i'm saying like i have this son has been raised up in my house born in my house knows my standard knows everything about how i think knows everything about what i value and can stand next to me as an heir that is how we stand with christ that is who the lord has called us to be it's this full maturity um it's often indicated by an ability to care for others it's often indicated by my, our, our 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 walk as a believer not necessarily always being about us or our prayers aren't always about us or how the world's impacting me or what i think or how i feel but more like father my community father my my family father these people that i go to church with like you start carrying people like this you carry them like your father carries them i told this story one time um, I actually told it to our church not too long ago, but we actually lost our son in the woods uh, last summer. Scariest day of my life. Well, not scariest, but you know what I'm saying? Like very, very scary. He was six. We lost him in um, Massachusetts. Um, he was only gone for a couple of minutes, but in that period of time, how I felt about finding my son. And um, it was just this, and actually Dak, Nick was there too. He was 200 feet away. We're screaming his name into the woods. We couldn't find him anywhere. It was horrible um finally did find him but it was this picture in my heart of, that's how the lord feels about everybody that's not with him that's how he feels about all these ones that are struggling and stuck in their stuff and stuck in their their pain and stuck in their their brokenness or their sin or whatever it is that's how he feels about him and so when we become julio sons of the lord we start caring about the earth and his people the way that the lord does that's the full maturity it's this um I know the Lord's got me. Like, I know I'm his son. I know I'm entirely sourced by him and loved by him. And now my life is sort of driven by making sure the Lord's heart is accomplished in the earth, making sure his will is being done and his love is being known and experienced. And as far as I, as far as I'm able to model it, that it comes out of my life into the people around me. That to me is what Julios looks like. It's full on maturity um, in his, in his name and in his model, in his likeness. Okay. Thanks. That's great. Yeah. You exhorted us to be broken before the Lord, the Lord, mm -hmm. to allow him to teach us and for us to learn from him. And you implored us to allow who he made us to be, to mm -hmm. be a witness and a blessing in what we are and who we are. And we are real different. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of nerds in this room and there's a few derelicts. <laughs> and, and I think that um, many that do look alike and want to not um, ruffle feathers, it's out of a good heart. Mm -hmm. It's out of a, a humility. Mm -hmm. But it's a it's God wants us to come out. Mm -hmm. God wants us to be who we are. I even tried to be a good boy for two years. And God afterwards, he said, are you happy? <laughs> yeah. I, literally, I told him, hell no. And he said, I didn't make it this way. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but it it was a good heart of mine. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be godly. I wanted to be, I wanted to please God. Mm -hmm. I was something I wasn't mm -hmm. until he allowed, you know, told me how stupid I was. But it's from a good heart. And and I, I, yeah, good enough. You, hold on. Do you feel um, his pleasure more now that you feel like you're being more yourself? Uh, it's been about 40 years, so it's, I'm happy with it. I don't know about everybody else. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> oh, yeah, I am free because I have been taught by Jesus, and I know him, <sighs> and he, he is my Lord, and he has, he's my life, and for me to... For me to not be who he made me would be an offense in my mind to him. Mm. It, it's, it's, you know, he made me mm -hmm. like me. Now I've got, there's a lot of crumbs still to pick up, sure. right? Okay. There's, I still have a few crumbs to pick up, but, uh, you know, I want that. I want a, that exhortation of being broken before him mm -hmm. to where here I am. And all those things that we think, like you said, you know, you that are right and God mm -hmm. who did the and he says, nah, you're stupid. You're mm -hmm. you know that I have something better for you. I can take that from you. You can lose that. Or you can gain this. Or 
he will chisel us into his image by that brokenness. But if we're afraid to be ourselves, we might miss something. Think? Yes. It was because you just said, um, you said you think it's out of a good heart. There are some, I think, that aren't themselves because it comes out of a, a place of insecurity. Um, I don't know if that's more common with women or with men. I don't know if that's a such thing, but I think if it's our insecurity that's causing us to really back up, we really got to let the Lord dismantle that piece by piece because insecurity is such a sin against our design. We are really created like in divine. That's right. You yeah. Know? yeah. So, yeah. Hi, Dan. This is Richard. Hi. Uh, I don't mind the uh, breadcrumbs. In fact, I like the breadcrumbs. It's the uh, bread trucks that I <laughs> Well, just share. <laughs> uh, all right. We're going to have to meditate on that. Listen, we got a, a time for like one, maybe two more questions. Uh, Sunny, go for it. And uh, we're going to let Diane get out of here at noon, uh, our time, to her time. She's probably got dinner to fix or something. I don't know. What are you no, doing? Said, Nick and the kids are at Cracker Barrel, so they just got home. I think we're good. Go ahead. All right. Uh, my name's Sonny, and I'm one of the derelicts. Oh, yeah. okay. good. And uh, yeah. anyway, you know, it, it's such a walk of, uh, I've always felt like a sense of, I guess you could call it rebellion since I was a kid, but, uh, sorry, you know, that, that tenacity rises up to be who you are. And a lot of times it's a broken place that you're operating out of, mm -hmm. but I agree with you that it's, uh, it's really important to have that, find that tenacity inside because everybody has it. And if we become too compliant, we become what everybody else wants us to be. And it's a fake life and you can feel it. And it, the heart of God feels it because he's after, he's tenacious after the nature that he created you to be and the whole. So thank you for that. What is your first name? Uh, Sonny. Uh, are you an idea guy? Do you have ideas a lot? Uh, yeah, I have a lot of concepts and ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I work with several people who also experience uh, what you call it. You didn't say rebellion. What's the word you have? You have a rebel or? Yeah, I just feel that kind of like. Yeah, a little bit of a renegade thing. Rebel. going. On. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So my experience of people who constantly have this bug inside of them to go rogue, we joke, I jokingly tell them they're always going rogue. They're always going off the script we agreed on. No matter what we agreed on, they have to go rogue because they just like to try something different. My experience is those individuals oftentimes have a pretty incredible call from the Lord on their life. Like you have visions and ideas because you are a little bit of a visionary or a little bit of somebody who could really, um, just has this innate ability inside to bring new ideas into the earth. So feel very encouraged in your rogueness. A lot of times the Lord designed that so that you think different than the script and can bring new ideas into the earth. And a lot of times it benefits society when you do. So go for it. Thank you. Be really nice to do whoever does your paperwork or your schedule or whatever, because just be nice to him or her. Go, go. Yeah, please. Be nice to the nerds too. Amen. Diane, this has been, it's been magnificent. I uh it doesn't have to be the last time we do this either. Uh okay. oops, hang on a second. The TV was about to, the TV was about to turn you off. <laughs> so uh anyway, this doesn't have to be the last time we do this because uh I've, I've, I've started saying I'd rather leave somebody with good questions than good answers mm -hmm. because ultimately I don't believe people change because of what I tell them. I think they change because of what they dialogue with, with the Lord. And I think you've stirred that up a little bit. Um, Sonny and Eddie are, are naturals. There's some of us here that have shorter hair, no hair that still need exactly that same exhortation. So thank you very much. Would you guys, 
Say thanks, give your hand. Thank you very much. And in particular, Diane, would you just pray for us, uh, for, for specifically what you were talking about? And then that last thing you said is like so tweetable or whatever you call it. Insecurity is a sin against our design. That is super powerful. Mm-hmm. And I just I just pray that that settle in our hearts here. And when we're tempted to be insecure or we're tempted to conform for the sake of conforming, not standing out, uh, mm-hmm. God, do something in us mm-hmm. to deliver yes. us from that. So go ahead and pray for us, would you? Yeah, God, I just ask first that we would all be so confident that we were made by you and so that you are perfectly skilled at communicating with us. And no matter how we're used to it looking for other people or how we're used to it appearing or the, the holiest ways or all of the ways we think prayer ought to look or all the ways we think Bible study ought to look or all the ways we think church ought to look, God, we just ask that your specific and personal voice would be known in each of our hearts and that we would begin to um, pay very diligent attention to our thoughts that we would listen when we when we have something enter our mind and that we would say, God, this feels like your voice. Start talking to me. God, that would help me to pay attention. Help me to recognize when you're laying a thought before my feet. Help me to recognize when you're pulling my heart. Help me not to lay your words down. Help me not to treat them with a busy heart. Help me to prioritize when you talk to me. Help me to prioritize stilling my heart. Help me never, ever, ever to say, you know what, God, I just don't have time or I just don't whatever. Help me to find windows in my life. Help me to look around for the opportunities of knowing your voice in my daily life and help me to trust it and help me to lay down my fight and just to truly learn to let you lead me. Father, when your ideas create conflict with the people around me, help me to be humble Help me to present gently, not militantly or aggressively, but to present what you're doing in my heart and to partner and submit with the people around me so that I'm never wrestling against other pieces of your nature. And I'm never fighting against other people of your heart. Help the people with ambition never to resent or judge the people who are slower to respond. Help the people who are anxious never to resent the people who seem to never care. God, help us to always remember that your society is in balance with us, to respect each other, to treat each other with honor, to learn from one another, to humble ourselves before one another, to be passionate alongside each other, and to build up the body of Christ in the full reflection of your nature and all your characteristics and all your dynamics and the fullness of your heart revealed in our communities and in our families and in our, in our, in our earth then as well. God, we just bless you. We trust you to teach us and to talk to us. We trust you to meet with us in our innermost hearts. And we trust you to open our hearts, to get rid of the things you got to get rid of. We do not fight against you. We partner with you and we trust you with every single detail of who we are. And we know that whatever you break, you fix. Whatever you break, you put back together stronger. Whatever you break, you're redeeming. It always resurrects. <laughs> it always comes back to life. It's never in the grave forever. It always comes back healthy. And so we just praise you as healer. We praise you as sustainer and as our breath and as our life. And we love you and we honor you for today. And help us just to always just take it and run with it from here. God, thank you so much. And bless the people of Joyland. Help them to have an incredible week. Bless the leadership they have there. Bless the curiosities and passions of their heart. And let there be such a revelation of your love in that house, Father. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Diane, thank you so much for being such a great example. Somebody who's found her voice and finding their voice. Guys, this is what I'm talking about. This is what we're going after. So thank you. Bless your family. Tell Mark hi for me. I will. I will. Thank you very much. We love you all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.